Good afternoon um, and welcome back um, to this amazing conference. I hope you all had um, a good break because um, we are now about to embark on a trip to, to Malta. Uh, our first speaker is Dr. Frederica Jus. Uh, Dr. Frederica Jus completed her PhD in Baroque art with a specific focus on propagandist motives in historical narratives. She also carried out research on palatial decoration in the 19th century for her masters. She has published on prominent palaces in Malta and is in the process of publishing her other research. She's an independent researcher and a visiting lecturer at University of Malta and lectures on Baroque art and museum curating. When in early 1610, the Bolognese artist Lionel Spada set foot in the Master's Palace in Valletta, he would have witnessed an austere building devoid of many of the artistic treasures that we see today. This paper discusses Spada's extensive fresco cycle of the early history of the Order of the Knights of St. John that was commissioned by Grand Master Alof de Bunyancourt and planned by prominent Italian knights within his court. Lionel Spada's fresco cycle was executed in 1610 in three reception rooms at the Grand Master's Palace. The fresco's narrative has a complicated intellectual, didactic and propagandistic nature, which corresponds to the carefully edited story that the knights wanted to give their troubled history. The fresco celebrate the knights' virtuous legacy and demonstrate the sophistication of Winyakot's patronage and his desire to project a work that reflects the manner in which grand palaces were decorated. I will discuss the patronage pattern of the fresco cycle and the way it illustrates the literary and visual sources for its heroic narrative. In reality, even though the 500 year old history of the order was dotted with successes and glorious moments, it was in general one of military retreats. Over the centuries, the knights were displaced further away from the city of Jerusalem which was the very essence of their institution and existence. It became imperative that in their own magistrate palace, the knights prevent, presented a favourable heroic slant to what was essentially a history of refuge, which saw the older loose territories that had been in Christian hands from the 11th and 12th centuries. The result is a cycle that honours, promotes and demonstrates the military achievements, religious duty and virtues of good governance to the elite audience of the palace. Indeed, at the onset of this commission, the oldest chroniclers, chroniclers and intellectuals behind Sparta's decorative scheme had to face the decision and select episodes that responded to their desire to decorate the palace with a particularly faithful view of the oldest history. In 1601, Winyakot was elected as Grand Master and took up residence in the Grand Master's Palace. The palace stands out in its setting where it commands the space of the main square in Valletta along the principal road of the city. Spada's fresco cycle is located on the Piano Nobile of the building, along the way known as the Summer Apartments. The cycle of 24 episodes maps out the order's history in a chronological sequence over three rooms. The cycle begins in 1060 with the Order's institution and narrates their movements through illustrious personages in virtuous scenes of military campaigns, miraculous occurrences and political alliances. The cycle concludes with their move to the Terrible in 1522, a few years prior to their transfer to Malta. The history culminates in the next room, the Grand Council Hall, with earlier frescoes by Matteo Perez Salecho, carried out in the 1570s, depicting the Great Siege of 1565, a glorious battle in the oldest history. The first room in Spada's decorative programme illustrated the conquest of the Holy Land. The scenes narrate the beginning of the religiously charged crusades and the knight's mission in defending the Holy Land. The orders intend to display the themes of miracles, the expression of good governance, and their administrative role create a powerful political messages on the board of their own paths. The episodes narrate subjects from the order's history, including early sieges and traditions that found their roots during the 11th and 12th centuries. The selected narratives describe the duality of the knight's vows and character, and the dichotomy of peace and war in their history. The early protagonists of the oldest history are commemorated through these scenes, 
most notably Peter the Hermit, Blessed Gerard, and Master Among the Poor. These principal characters direct the narrative through episodes of the Crusades, warfare, arrivals, and departures. In the pages' room, the subject of defeat is retold in a triumphant manner, and other devices are employed by Spada to evoke pity and compassion within the audience at the palace. The frame, sorry, yes, the framing allegories of virtues intensify the sentiments of bravery, courage, justice, honor, and valor that are analogous to chivalry and complement the propaganda stone. The presence of King Andrew II of Hungary, Frederick II, Richard Count of Cornwall, and Saint Louis in these scenes is a reminder of the order's alliances and clout within the wider crusading context in Europe. Spada's decorative program in the final room illustrates the aftermath of the Order's expulsion from the Holy Land that is narrated in the second and third volumes of Portio's Historia. The episodes detail the Order's movements in the year 1291 to 1522 and maps out their journey from Cyprus through to Rhodes and their arrival in the Terrible. Six of the eight episodes are set in Rhodes where the ninth settled for over 200 years. Leading figures in the Order, including Geda Bassan and El Adam, ruled the Knights during this time of exile. The inclusion of Amadeus V, the Count of Savoy, reinforces the political alliances despite the circumstances. The inclusion of Jem Sultan, who is referred to as Zizimi in the narrative, enhances the Knights' status in an episode where the Order played a pivotal role as political brokers in an event that linked Europe, paper Rome, and the Knights with the Eastern Empire, where they successfully accommodated the Sultan's brother. Spada's scheme combined two scenes and three framing figures as a frieze along the upper part of each wall, in a format similar to the great siege frescoes at the Grand Master's Palace and the mythological scenes at Palazzo Parta in Bologna. Spada's episodes are set as quadruple portati, identified by descriptive cartouches. The cartouche plays a fundamental role in identifying the narrative and its protagonists, as well as giving the defined heroic slant to the cycle. The framing figures, referred to as ceremony, follow an independent scheme that enhances the significance of the narrative. The framing figures in the committee's room represent the Beatitudes, which are symbolic of the eight-pointed cross worn by on the habit of the order. The scenes in the pages' room are flanked by virtues that are extolled in the main episodes. Characters from the Old Testament frame the scenes of the last room and through their inscriptions form a metaphor for the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ that run parallel to the tragic and victorious scenes in the Order's history. Apart from this, these represent the theme of exile, which characterizes the narrative of the world. An analysis of the format, iconography, and sources of Spada's frescoes at Grand Master's Palace classifies them within the tradition of fresco decoration in Renaissance Europe, most notably in Italy through its informed patronage, intellectual narrative, decorative scheme, and contemporary stylistic manner. The episodes depicted have a clear relation to their literary and visual sources, which through this study have been defined as the literary work of the historian Giacomo Porto and the printed matter of Antonio Tempesta. Crusading ideology was ushered by rhetoric, which is intimately tied to propaganda. Rhetoric observes the modes of persuasion through directing the audience's emotions and gaining their trust. In the case of Spada as an artist working for the Order, by following Winyakot and his court's guidelines to portray the knights as benevolent and using Porzio's published history as the trusted source, the audience's views are directed accordingly and are convinced through the proof given in the historical narrative. The fresco cycle is grounded in the humanist ideas surrounding Bunyan Court's inner circles, and through the style and subject matter, one can isolate the preferences of the patron himself. This humanistic quality in the narrative scheme shows it to be the work of a number of conoscenti that moved in the intimate circles of Grand Master Bunyan Court's government. In the absence of complete documentation, it is possible to envision a scenario of a special committee assigned to this commission which in this case was composed of prominent Italian knights. This could possibly include the Borsio brothers, Giacomo and Giannotto, who are both intimately tied to the order through their family history and roles as agent and vice-chancellor respectively, and who both had a profound knowledge of the history of the order. 
I will discuss drug molecular in relation to these literary sources. By the date of his father's arrival in Malta, Giacomo's brother Giannotto was one of the most influential and powerful men in the order. His role as head up of the Chancery meant that he was almost effectively in control of the everyday running of the island, and that he had direct access to the Grand Monster and to all that concerned the order. His clout within the palace makes it likely that Giannotto was also involved with the Fresco Commission. Fra Alessandro Orsi emerges as a protagonist through the Grand Master's letters in the archives and through his role of receiver for the Order in Bologna. He was responsible for communicating the selection of Spada to the Grand Master. Francesco Dell'Antella acted as Bunyancourt's cultural advisor on different occasions and his documented interest in this commission and the Order places him in direct involvement with the cycle. His involvement can be confirmed through a possible portrait of him that Spada included in the fresco cycle. It is clear that these protagonists were partly responsible for the propagandist tone in their directed use of sources and political presence on the island. William Court's interest as a patron of high levels of sophistication for the order is manifest through the commission of the last volume of Giacomo Bozio's Historia and the manner in which he accommodated Caravaggio in Malta prior to Spada's journey to the island. It is evident that William Court exercised direct control over Spada's fresco cycle. Through the involvement of his court, use of literary sources and his physical presence in the palace, William Court's own agenda was imprinted on the narrative through the emphasis of French Grand Masters and in the depiction of the miracle of the Virgin of Vies in the committee's room, which was a personal devotion of his. Prior to Spada's undertaking, the choice of episodes to be depicted was probably discussed in detail by this special committee, as happened in other documented cases. A 1606 document reveals that Cunyancourt sought to commission an unfortunately unnamed Florentine Frescante for the work in the palace. The commission never materialized, despite its seemingly advanced planning stage. In 1609, a few months after Caravaggio's departure, Cunyancourt returned to his wishes to decorate the palace. Instead of re-establishing contact with Florence, he now wrote to Bologna, the leading centre at the time, to commission a frescante. This change of mind is extremely significant and shows that Cunyancourt had stylistically revised his plans for the palace in order to follow the latest trends in Italian court. The parameters for Spada's path to Malta are reported in the archives and follow the previous arrangement set for the Florentine Frescante, whereby he was to stop in Naples for materials and provisions. Spada's was documented in Bologna at the end of November 1609 and possibly left for Malta along with his assistant soon after. The orders receiver in Naples, Vincenzo Carafa, paid Spada 200 ducats to purchase materials, which, although are not specified in documents, may have included plaster, which was probably not available in Malta. Now let's discuss the artist and why he was chosen for the commission. Spada emerges as a diverse figure in the first decade of the 17th century, where he joined the reformist climate within the Accademia degli Incarnati and practiced the latest stylistic trends from the Caracci artists. By remaining in Bologna, Spada combined this aesthetic with an indirect classicist influence through Ludovico Caracci and remained attached to the artist. His scenes demonstrate simplicity, composition, naturalism, and the influence of Vicaracci's style. Undeniably, his father, when in Malta, could not have failed to make comparisons between the Grand Master's Palace and the palaces he knew well in Bologna. His father was clearly well versed in this tradition, and this is evident through this work, pictures in Palazzo Bonfiglioli Rossi, where he collaborated with others for the decoration of three rooms. This is one of the scenes attributed to Spada, where his figures invade real space in their acute naturalness and sculptural quality. The dimensions of the frieze, the way the colour scheme of the frescoes match the ceiling palette, and the depiction of telemony in these rooms attest to the typology of fresco decoration Spada was first in. Rooted in the, sorry, the developments established by the Caracci's in Bolognese palaces, such as Palazzo Fava and Palazzo Magnami. Winyakov's requirements for the artist are clearly outlined to Alessandro Rossi, and it appears that these were discussed in detail prior to the selection of Spada. 
The artist was selected on account of his reputation and according to how well he fit the predefined criteria. Winyakut specifically requested an artist who could work both in oil and fresco, which was highly valued due to the potential for commissions and uniformity in decoration. Spada was required to imbue his scenes with highly charged colours and through his use of illuminative and realistic hues, brought Bozio's text to life in the most realistic way. The Emilian naturalistic colouring that was characteristic of Spada's early years clearly emerges in Monti's frescoes. Spada's bravura painting in quadratura was well known, and although Winyako does not specifically mention the words, his prerequisite and reference to fresco con fondamento di disegno di prospettiva shows that he envisioned something typical of the term. This typology of painting within the Bolognese context is best defined as the new manner of mural decoration in Bologna, which employed the frieze with scenes by the Atlantis of semi-architectural character. That aptly applies to Spada's typology of decoration for the Grand Moses Palace. The condition for Prestezza and Spada's execution was possibly a logistical requirement for Vignan Court. However, it relates to the technique of painting with speed. The skill was admired in artists as long as the technique and quality of the work was not compromised. Finally, another of Vignan Court's required requests regarded Spada's code of contact. Bonta de costume e de tradizioso e amabile suo modo di procedura which alludes to Grandma's, the Grandmaster's bitter experience with Caravaggio. Although Spada was well versed with the typology of fresco decoration, the subject of the early history of the order was completely novel for the artist. We will now discuss the literary and visual sources he utilized to forcefully illustrate the themes and ideas. The main themes that run through the narrative are arrivals and departures, battles and alliances, and relics and miracles. The episodes depicted have a clear relation to their literary and visual sources, namely the work of Giacomo Bozio and the printed matter of Antonio Tempesta, as two of the major influences in the narrative sequence and composition format. Let us discuss Giacomo Bozio first. Bozio was a letterato and seasoned diplomat in the Order's affairs, with degrees in civil and canonical laws. Bozio held the position as agente cronista for almost four decades. His family connections and knowledge of the history and administration of the order earned him his title and role within the order's office in Rome where he resided. The narrative of Spada's fresco cycle was dictated by the literary sources and a comparative study confirmed that the wording on the majority of titoli of the episodes is directly quoted from Bozio's Historia. Bozio's Historia, published in three volumes under the patronage of Grandmas de Verdad and Mignacourt, was the first successfully completed historical record on the order of St. John from its institution up until contemporary times. Bozio maps out the detailed narrative using a number of published and unpublished sources, archival evidence from the order itself and the Vatican, and memoirs from his own family members, who are prominent Italian knights. Naturally, the tone is favourable to the order, due to the intimate ties of Bozio's family, his own role as agent, and the fact that the Grandmaster himself appointed him to publish the work. His writings, which are buttressed by a number of allegories, religious symbolism, and political evocations, show his commitment and profound knowledge of the order and the potentiality of rhetoric. Through his well-documented role of Pranissa, Giacomo was likely consulted for the fresco narrative. Thus, specific extracts from Bozio's text provide one of the descriptions of Sparta's frescoes. It is recorded in the archives that Alessandro Orsi in Bologna had a copy of Bozio's Historia during the time of the commission. Thus, it is very possible that Sparta began to prepare and read Bozio prior to coming to Malta. The episode titles must have been presented to Sparta, who looked up and read the relevant extracts for his scenes. An example that illustrates the use of Bozio is one of the earliest and significant events in the in his historia, and the first episode for the narrative of Spartan's fresco cycle. This episode depicts the institution of the order, with Peter the Hermit leaving Jerusalem to canvas for a crusading movement in 1060. The title of the episode is noted in a cartouche beneath the scene, summarizing the actions of the main characters and opening the narrative. This is directly linked to Bozio's text as shown in the common language underlined between the two. 
the wedding in Spada's titolo and that symposium's text is almost identical. Spada skillfully created a precise interpretation of the scene as described by Bozio, as for example can be seen in the fall of Jerusalem in 1187 in the first room. This happens after the siege against Jerusalem, which is narrated over five pages in Bozio. The episode specifically shows the knights exiting the city of Jerusalem and the Turks entering it after their victory. It is clear that Spada pondered heavily on Bozio's text and imbues the figures of the knights with gestures which show, as Bozio puts it, gravissima e incomparabile perdita. perdita sorry. The knights are being shown evicted by the Turks almost exactly as is described by Bozio and the way they exit the city of Jerusalem once the Turks enter through the other side is presented by Spada in great accuracy to Bozio's text. Partiti essendo Gerusalemme i latini, entro dall'altra parte il saladino, which he uses to highlight the cruelty inflicted on the knights. Spada experimented in the genre of naturalistic studies and caricatures at the Accademia degli Incaminati. Previous preparatory work reports his studies in caricature, caricature, and this experience was put into practice in Malta, where Spada includes two characters in a subtle, satirical manner. In this episode, pictured, Spada depicted two grotesque caricature-like figures holding the large sum of money that the order had to pay for the liberation of the king. The two figures seem to mock the scene itself for its propagandistan opinions. Cesare Ripa's Iconologia was by the time of Spada's commission one of the most iconic publications for artists. This work bridged the gap between the literary and visual sources for this fresco cycle. Spada utilized the 1603 publication for the depiction of the Beatitudes and allegories of virtues in the first and second rows, and followed Ripa's descriptions in precise detail for their edition. The 1603 edition was published with woodcut illustrations. Five of these were used as visual sources for the relative allegories, Spada being directly inspired to the point of almost copying them. Thus, although the cycle is grounded in traditional concepts, contemporary sources were used to enhance the significance of the narrative. Other visual sources can be cited for the depiction of battle scenes, which amount to half the total of the total number of episodes in the fresco cycle, in line with the many battles that publish in the oldest history. Strong correlations between Spada's scene and the work of Antonio Tempesta, a reputable designer, engraver, and artist in Rome at the time, showed the latter to be the main visual source. Interestingly, Giacomo Bozio was a patron of Tempesta, and one of his most notable works, A Plan of Rome, was dedicated to the, his to the historian. This attests to Winyakot and his court's direct control over the sources that influence the fresco cycle. To further this point, Spada quoted an engraving from Grandmaster Verdal's statute, where the scene depicting the assembly of the first chapter general is clearly lifted from this book. Tempesta's scene of scenes of combat depict the theme violence of Plastica that recreates a staged battle adapted for painted work resulting in the effect of harmonious violence and somewhat peaceful warfare that is far removed from the reality of the subject. This definition of the term, violence of plastica, can be applied to Spada's work at the palace. Tempesta built his compositions from a long-stemming tradition rooted in the works of the Renaissance masters, where they presented battles as compendiums of different poses and views of the human body. Riding in pain or poison attack, whether on horseback or on foot. One of the leading characteristics of these battle scenes is the idea that order and harmony can coexist in a naturally chaotic scene. There is no harsh realism or violence that one would expect to see in such an episode. The artist instead allows for certain incongruences in favor of the overall scheme of the scene. The charging action of the frontal figure that begins the flowing movement in Tempesta's work is repeated in Spada's, as is the upfront skirmish. Interestingly, Spada never copied one of Tempesta's battle scenes exactly, but was clearly inspired by them. His previous battle scenes in Palazzo Bonfiglioli Rossi do not follow the same movement, and thus it seems likely that Tempesta's prints were a directed source from Winyakov's court. 
Each scene increased the comprehension of the text, while the transformation of the written rule into a pictorial representation highlights its importance and allows the Grand Master to imprint his patronage stamp on the finished product. This was one of Sparta's most successful commissions, and to mark its prestige, he included his own self-portrait in the last scene of the fresco cycle. His gaze was perfectly planned to make eye contact with all those entering the last room as a strong message of pride in his work. The fresco cycle is a triumph in patronage in the region and setting of Malta as an importation of Cinquecento Italian tradition in Sparta's contemporary aesthetic and through its strong affiliation to Portugal's historia, thus directing Guignacourt's political interests as a patron in its propagandist motives. By investigating the protagonists for the commission and their roles within the order and the Italian land, the narrative in the Grand Master's Palace reveals a clear propagandist intent. The form, function and historic subject of the frescoes place the cycle within the tradition of Cinquecento Italy. The literary and visual sources for the fresco cycle attest to the informed patronage in updating the established tradition to the order's requirements. The depictions of battered scenes built on traditional aesthetics and the application of visual sources from the order itself presents the most vivid form of propaganda. Despite the region and Northeast context and difficulties involved with fresco painting on the island, Spada produced a work grounded in tradition and contemporary taste as a testament to Minyakov's magistracy. Thank you. is Dr. Claude Bozotil, graduated at the University of Florence in 1998 with a master's degree in architecture, specializing in history of architecture, architecture and restoration of monuments. He has been practicing as an architect since 1999 and is presently a lecturer at the International Institute for Baroque Studies within University of Malta. In 2018, he defended successfully his PhD thesis entitled The Influence of French Military Engineers on Maltese Architecture During the Reign of Louis XIV at the University of Rouen in France. He is the author of various papers published in Malta and abroad, mainly on Maltese architecture. Buon pomeriggio a tutti. Volevo, innanzi per eccellenza, grazie per essere presente. Volevo ringraziare tutti gli organizzatori per questa magnifica, per avermi invitato a partecipare a questa magnifica conferenza. Ehm, quello che volevo dire, il, il mio discorso sarà in inglese, ma commenterò un, un po' a lungo andare in italiano, così i miei amici italiani qui presenti possono capire meglio il concetto di tutto ciò. E poi se avete domande in Italia ovviamente posso rispondere anche io in italiano. The majority of historical studies on foreign influence affecting the order of St. John while in Malta focus mainly on Italian and Spanish influence. Various historians consider Malta as an extension of the vice kingdoms of Naples or Sicily. Its history is often viewed in this perspective, and particular importance is attributed to the secret of Spanish influence. Maltese histori biography, historio historiography sorry, hardly highlights the extent of French influence. This is also due to Malta's colonial history under British domination. The negative image of France, especially due to the French occupation of the Maltese islands by General Bonaparte, was transmitted from one generation to another. Consequently, the heritage imparted by the French during the order's reign is all too often ignored or unappreciated. Maltese architectural historians disregard this influence completely. Given this premise, this paper proposes a new approach that aims to shed light upon the importance of French influence on Maltese architecture by placing it in the historical context of the power games that were played within the order itself. It will take as its starting point the arrival of the knights on the island, up to the time 
when the French influence begins to develop greatly in the 17th century, both on the political and the military levels. In this context, the question that is posed is, can we speak of a new form of endemic Baroque architecture that is typical of the Maltese islands, which is composed of a unique mixture of different European styles that are blended with Maltese traditional vernacular architectural elements? What were the predominant styles influencing Maltese architecture, and what was the French contribution? In order to determine these influences, the aim of this paper is not to examine Maltese Baroque architecture in a purely local and regional context. On the contrary, the study aims to examine how the predominant architecture styles in Europe were brought to Malta through the order's foreign policies, which were turned towards the continent and, as from the middle of the 17th century, were directed in particular towards France. In effect, the contribution of military architecture introduced by various French military engineers has never really been taken into consideration. The study does not limit itself to simply examining the architecture penalties, sorry, to uh, simply uh, realities, sorry, to be studied, but to consider them in the context of the order's effort to affirm itself as the defender of Christianity and the ways it has to negotiate its allegiances given its international composition and profile. The Order of St. John chose Malta as its headquarters in 1530 after having been expelled from Rhodes. During the 268 years in Malta, the Order's alliances shifted progressively from Spanish domination to more independent relations with other European countries and France in particular. The consequences of this transformation were not only political, but also of a cultural and aesthetic nature. French influence on Malta can be traced to the beginning of the 17th century, even though the more tangible results of this influence reach their peak during the 18th century, up to the end of the order's presence in 1798. In particular, during the beginning of the 18th century, there is a very, very strong, quite a strong influence under the Grand Mastership also between Pereios and uh, Antonio Manuel de Vilena. This paper will therefore focus on the beginnings, however, of the French influence and concentrates mainly on the period covering the reign of Louis XIV between 1643 and 1715. Up to the beginning of the 17th century, Malta was still like a fief of the Spanish Empire. The predominance of the Spanish influence, also present in the south of Italy, greatly influenced architectural development in Malta due to interventions of the Spanish and Italian military engineers who were mainly responsible for the building of the first military fortifications commissioned by the Knights. During the first half of the 17th century, Italian and Spanish interests still dominated the local scene. Rome sent the military engineer Pietro Paolo Floriani da Macerata, here we're seeing the fortifications of Valletta, in 1636, to design a new line of fortifications outside Valletta. In 1638, another military engineer, Vincenzo Macolano da Firenzuola, was sent by Francesco Barberini to give new advice about the fortifications and the Grand Harbor. Moreover, in 1640, Giovanni de' Medici, Marquez di Sant'Angelo, came to Malta to draw a report on the state of the defensive lines. However, Spanish inertia during the Great Siege and Spanish and Spain's gradual decadence during the 17th century indicated to the order that it could no longer expect any real military aid from Spain. During the 17th century, the Order of Malta was prospering and its authority over the Maltese Islands was progressively affirming itself. The Order had adopted the formula of Christian militant states, given that it still had to face its enemies, in particular the threatening presence of the Ottomans. These are, sorry, these are the Floriani uh, fortifications around 1640. And uh, here we're seeing the Grand Harbor with the fortifications 
um, uh, of the cotton of uh, Firenzuola on one side uh, around Vittoriosa and uh, Sanglea and the Floriana fortifications outside Valletta. The Ottoman Empire was still a powerful force to be reckoned with, as can be seen from its offensive attack in the War of Candia between 1645 and 1669. However, in contrast with the preceding century, and despite its aggressive political stance, the Ottoman Empire was less feared by the West towards the end of the 17th century, when it had slowly started to decline. The order's power was rather limited when compared to that wielded by the Christian states. Therefore, the order was always looking for a powerful protector. From the military aspect, its military, its principal aim, had always been that of fighting its eternal enemies, the Ottomans and the Corsairs. This meant that the order was in a constant state of alert. However, since the threat of the Ottoman power was diminishing, more the strategic importance at the heart of the Mediterranean, controlling access to the Western Mediterranean, began to decline. Malta was no longer considered as the key for accession to the East. Consequently, the order depended more and more on its diplomatic relations and Christian powers. French influence on the order may be witnessed in various domains. However, the principal aim of this study is to show how the order's changing foreign policy brought in French influence on its military architecture, and through this, on civil and ecclesiastical architecture during the second half of the 17th century and the beginning of the 18th. Classical French architecture, together with the new French theories regarding military engineering that were being elaborated upon, upon during the first half of the 17th century, assumed much greater importance under Louis XIV when they radiated towards foreign lands in the second half of the of this century. During this latter period, French theories concerning architecture and military engineering came to Malta. In this context, in this context, what was the influence of the French military engineers who came to Malta during this period on the fortifications of Malta and its architecture? How did this influence play uh, a and play a determining role in the concept choices and projects of Maltese architects. At the beginning of the 17th century, the efforts of Grand Masters de Paul and Lascaris, who tried to shift the balance towards French interests, were blocked by the Council of the Order, which was composed predominantly of Italian and Spanish knights. However, as the century progressed, French influence began to increase thanks to the presence of important personalities and political alliances, which were not only favorable to Malta, but also benefited French interests in the Mediterranean. The close relations between Cardinal de Richelieu and Grand Master Jean-Paul Lascaris Castellar were expressed through frequent correspondence. Thus, a reciprocal collaboration had already been begun in the beginning of the 17th century, when Richelieu actually modeled the Marine de France on that of the order. France considered Malta as an important ally and indispensable base for its fleet in the Mediterranean. During the second half of the 17th century, the Spanish Empire was already in an advanced decay, and French supremacy was slowly taking over. Even though the three lands of Provence, Auvergne, and France and their respective knights and commanders had always exerted a certain influence, French influence became preponderant during this period and remained thus up to the French Revolution. In this way, the order progressively established privileged relations with France. The important role played at the French court by the knights hospitallers, who defended the order's interests and obtained direct favors, is indisputable. The fact that a large number of its members occupied high-ranking positions at court was advantageous to the order because it allowed it to ask its members to intercede directly with the king in its favor. On the other hand, the French kings continued to call the Grand Master Mont Cousin. The order's shaling ships and galleys continued to enjoy certain privileges that had been progressively granted by Christian princes 
namely the predominance of its fleets over that of other nations. Louis XIV entered ensured that both in the French court and at sea, the privileges granted to the order by his predecessors were kept intact. The order managed its diplomatic relations with the great Western powers very adroitly, in particular with France during the 17th century and the beginning of the 18th. These diplomatic relations led to a systematic exchange of correspondence between the order and the French court, which contributed to a change in alliance from Spain to France. Diplomatic relations between the order and France during the 17th century became very courteous and intimate. Relations were generally excellent during the reign of Louis XIV, and the state of affairs continued during the whole of the 18th century. The arrival of important personalities in Malta, such as Blaise François Comte de Pagan, Louis Nicolas de Clerville, of whom we're seeing one of the sketches, the qui vediamo uno dei suoi schizzi, che sono sopravvissuti ad un memoriale, che purtroppo sono due, sono due, che non esiste più. And Louis Vicomte d'Arpajon, during the summer of 1645, marked not only the decline of the leading role of the Italians in the art of fortification building, but also the passage of the order from the sphere of influence of the Spanish Empire to that of France. The presence of the French delegation shows that the reputation of French military engineers was already generally recognized. In effect, in 1635, the order had already commissioned a certain Jardin to design the Porta Reale of Valletta. The exact, this was, questo era attribuito prima a Tommaso Dingli, ma io ho trovato in archivio una nota che dice che di questo è Jardin. Parlerò dell'identità, possibile identità di Jardin. The exact identity of Jardin is uncertain, but it is most likely that it could be Nicolas de Jardin, who is already recorded as an engineer in 1643. Between 1664, actually, and 1669, Desjardins was an assistant, guarda caso, to Louis Nicolas de Clairville at the Chateau de Trompette in Bordeaux. In 1617, the project of the Cotonera fortifications was entrusted to Antonio Maurizio Valperga from Turin. The implementation of this grand project gave rise to contradictory opinions and the arrival of the pres prestigious French military engineers in, in Malta che si sono posti tantissimo a questo progetto, soprattutto alle fortificazioni di Flariano al suo progetto. However, the fact, the fact that Valperga had been pre previously hired by Colbert and Charles Emmanuel II of Savoy shows clear that the order actually had not abandoned French influence, even though Valperga's fortifications were more all-Olandese rather than corresponding to the school of French military engineering led by then by Vauban already. Given the close relations, another image of uh, these plans by Antonio Maurizio Valperga showing the fortification, uh, fortifications of Valletta and uh, his project for Floriana. Given the close relations between France and the order, it is not surprising that during the second half of the 17th century, and the beginning of the 18th, various French military engineers came to Malta to oversee the system of defense. The presence of Médéric Blondel, the brother of the better known François Blondel, François Blondel, trovato anche che era venuto a Malta proprio, was to play a, a decisive role in the widespread application of French architectural principles in Malta. Blondel was the first French resident military engineer on the Maltese archipelago and can be considered as the catalyst for French influence on Maltese civil and ecclesiastical architecture. I shall explain. He was responsible for all the defense works and the water supply to the entire archipelago. During his stay in Malta between 1659, Sotto il Gran Maestrato di di Redin, and 1695, he finished the network of coastal defenses, which Grand Master Lascaris had started in 1647, and supervised all the major military works, including those designed by Valperga 
and later by Carlos de Grunenberg between 1680 and 1687. And with Carlos de Grunenberg, he had an ottima relation, and they worked so much in tandem. The eh, modifications, for example, of Blondel on many projects are immediately accepted and discussed by Grunenberg, who was a noted and famous engineer. The devices of the fortification of 1681, these are some drawings, designs of uh, Blondel, actually. Blondel actually wrote a script of the devices of the fortification uh, of 1681, gives a clear idea of the different roles he undertook during his 36 years of service with the order. Tanto tempo, eh? Tanti anni. Anche se era assente in qualche momento eh, perché andava spesso a fare in Francia, andava a Versailles, eccetera, eccetera. Furthermore, in his long report, Questo de Vie, Blondel criticizes heavily Valberga's design for the fortifications of Loriana. E non solo, chiese ai maggiori eh, ingegneri militari francesi di quell'epoca, nel 1681, di mandare corrispondenza al Gran Maestro allora Raccaraffa, dove non andava bene i, suoi, i progetti di Valberga. Eh, e ci sono varie corrispondenze. French influence was not only registered in the military field, but also in the civil domain. Actually, in the 1630s, as my friend uh, Armando mentioned, Antoine Garcin from Marseille was already commissioned to redesign the facade of the Auberge de Provence in Valletta. However, the classical elements in Maltese Baroque architecture were introduced by Blondel. So let's see quickly this from a drawing. This is a photo of the Auberge de Provence, where the whole front part was actually rebuilt. We thought at first that it was extended. Uh, past historians wrote that there was a piazza there, but it did not exist. It was recently found out that they pulled down the front facade and the rooms because they wanted to fit in magazzini to have, uh, this is the, the drawing you can see, the magazzini on the ground floor and the mezzanini um, uh, for, um, for revenue. Here we are seeing uh, some uh, also references actually to uh, the Louvre, to certain uh, the courtyard, the Courcarré in the Louvre. And uh, certainly these proportions and the detailing of the windows are French classicist. However, the classical elements in Maltese Baroque architecture were introduced by Blondel, who was imbued with his brother's writings and theories François Blondel, obviously, as well as those of the highly renowned school of classical French, French architecture like François Mansart and the, and the rest, so greatly appreciated by Louis XIV. The facades designed by Blondel are all less Baroque and more Mannerist, or rather, relate directly to French classicism. Blondel served as resident engineer of the, of the order for many years, and during his service, Grand Master Carafa, actually, personally commissioned him to construct a number of buildings. Amongst other works, he conceived the splendid facade of the Church of the Franciscan Miners, known as Tachizu, in 1687. We are seeing it here, unfortunately, Bethany's restoration, um, where again there are uh, uh, very, very evident classical elements. The Church of St. Francis of Assisi in 1681, which in spite of this photo has been recently uh, restored with the coat of arms of Carafa, and please note the frame within which the coat of arms of Carafa was inserted. The new facade of the Auberge uh, d'Italie, the, the, the facade of the Auberge d'Italie was completely redone by uh, Blondel in the 1680s under the Carafa. And uh, what is interesting, and actually links to Blondel, uh, apart from his uh, uh, triumphal uh, monument to, to Carafa, uh, which we are seeing here, is this the main doorway to uh, the Auberge d'Italie, which is, uh, lo and behold, guarda caso, è praticamente identica a quella del Forte di Sant'Angelo, che vediamo qui, che è, è di, dovrebbe essere di Grunenberg, ma secondo me è più del Blondel che l'ha abilizzata qua e là. Cioè, la l'ha usata in entrambi i nemici che praticamente è uguale, identica. 
and molto più interessante è la the Church of St. Luke, 1675, o in Valletta. La chiesa di San Rocco, che vediamo, è molto, anche questa è molto classicista, eh, anche i dettagli, e la pianta molto interessante è eh, disegnata da, dal Blondel sulla chiesa del noviziato dei Gesuiti di Etienne Martellange a Parigi, ora è distrutta, non, è, non esiste più. E questa è la pianta di, della chiesa del noviziato che esisteva a Parigi di Etienne Martellange sempre del stesso periodo. Blondel was also the engineer responsible for the construction of the Church of Santa of San of Sarria in Floriano, which you are seeing here, designed by Mattia Preti. Il concetto era di Mattia Preti di avere un, uh, un, uh, un pantheon piccolo, ecco, una, una chiesa rotonda. Eh, però è l'unica cupola che non ha sostegni da fuori e infatti abbiamo trovato un documento che dichiara che ha accanto a Mattia Preti eh, il Gran Maestro, eh, allora Cotonet, ha affiancato Blondel per la parte ingegneristica ovviamente perché Mattia Preti era un pittore più che altro e poi il suo capomastro di Blondel, guarda caso, era eh, Lorenzo Gaffà, fratello del famoso Melchiorre Gaffà e quindi questa è la pianta eh, di, della chiesa di Sarria, è la cupola che aveva in origine una lanterna ma poi è stata eliminata nel periodo inglese. Blondel trained or influenced the entire school of Maltese architecture of his time. His influence can be seen in the works of Maltese architects such as Francesco Salmout, the Carmelite Church in Dina, che ha fatto la eh, Giovanni Barbara di Paris Church, Vincenzo Casanova, Cospicua College Age Church e il più conosciuto Lorenzo Caffà che vediamo qui nella cattedrale di Undina. Who all stars did out actually as capomastri or assistants to Blondel um, uh, before launching into their careers as architects. These Maltese Baroque architects designed various buildings in Valletta and in other localities imbued with the French classical style, even though these facades displayed more audacious and plastic forms than those of Blondel. And in fact, Lorenzo Gaffa actually combined the French classical style with the Rome, Roman, uh, some Roman elements, like the top parts of the belfries uh, of the cathedral of Indina. But however, the structure, uh, the, 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 the facade per se, is still very classicist. So here we see the dome also of the um, uh, of uh, Gaffa uh, together with the lantern, which is very similar actually to Levo's um, uh, the Palais de Nation in the in Paris, the Academy. It's the interior of the of the uh, Cathedral of Emdina and the Lilia Parish Church. Concluding, the French military engineers applied their new concepts of defense to Malta following the leading role that Sebastien Lepresse de Vauban had given to France in the development of military architecture in the second half of the 17th century. Their presence contributed to the building of coastal fortifications, the high quality improvement of existing lines of fortification in the Grand Harbor, and the construction of Fort Manuel, of which the plan has many points in common with the works of Vauban. Here we are seeing some of the designs, actually these are by Tignier, who came at the beginning, uh, René Jacob de Tignier, in the 1715 campaign. The engineers who came to Malta in the beginning of the 18th century, such as Colong, de Tignier, Mondion, Maigret and Folar, had all been influenced by Vauban's school of thought. Consequently, all the fortifications built in Malta during the beginning of the 18th century reflect the best of French military architecture, from coastal battery and retrenchments to the last major fortresses, including the majority of the outworks, covered ways and classi, along the Valletta Floriana and Vittorio Zalan France, as well as in Dina. French influence on Maltese fortifications was already well established at the beginning of the 18th century and the last years of the reign of Louis XIV. The change of alliances from Spain to France 
became permanent after the death of Blondel in 1698, when Grand Master Ramon Perez de Siracofol, a Spanish, seeking military assistance, repaired to the French court to request a French military engineer. The arrival of Claude de Colong to Malta in 1703 marked a turning point because, from then on, French military engineers predominated the Maltese military architectural landscape. Following this new military approach, Louis XIV personally sent a military mission to Malta at the request of Grand Master Pereios. Although the Grand Master himself was Spanish, as I said, he preferred to ally the order with the French courts rather than the vast declining Spanish power. Médéric Blondel, Claude de Colong, and François Bachelieu were all employed by the order, directly by the order. However, relations with France were solidified through the presence of a group of French military engineers. These are some of their drawings sent by Louis XIV in 1714, all of whom belonged to the prestigious Royal Corps of Military Engineers. Following the orders emitted directly by the aged king himself, this team was placed under the command of the renowned Brigadier René Jacob de Tignier. At the time, Tignier was already one of the most experienced engineers in France, with 26 years of active experience. Quindi the 2014 non ho mandato per il primo ingegnere o un dilettante, o uno che aveva appena cominciato. This contingent had a decisive influence on the concept and the development of Maltese fortifications right up to the last decades of the century. Consequently, the final appearance, size and character of Maltese fortifications are largely the, the result of the school of French military engineers. Tinier was accompanied in particular by Charles-François de Mondion, who was also to leave a strong mark on Maltese 18th century architecture. This is the Fort Manuel. Um, the most obvious result of the French influence may be seen in the coastal defences of Morta and Gozo, the Redoubts, the Ridotti, the Batteria, and the ditches built between 1715 and 1717, which were planned to resist any external invasion. These lines of defence were inspired by models experimented in France towards the end of the 17th century. Although a large number of batteries only materials on the Maltese coast between 1715 and 1717, the plan to, be, to build these fortifications in the French manner had initially been proposed in 1714 by two special envoys, furono inviati dal Vici XIV, che si chiamavano Dargini e Fontaine, and by François Bachelier, a military engineer of minor importance. Quindi, French influence on Maltese architecture, questo è il Forte Manuel, una foto aerea del Forte Manuel, Vauban ne ha una praticamente identica, questa è una delle batterie di Mestra. French influence on Maltese architecture lasted well beyond Blondel. As this paper has shown, the progressive shift of political influence from Spain to France also left an indelible mark on Maltese architecture. French influence, which existed marginally in the 16th century, grew steadily during the 17th century and triumphed in the 18th. The presence of French military engineers obviously contributed to the formation of an endemic Baroque architecture that has its own distinctive style and characteristics. Grazie mille. <laughs>
allora, Jacopo Berincampi, laureato secum lode presso la facoltà di architettura dell'Università di Studi di Roma Sapienza nel 2014 e abilitato sia all'esercizio della professione di architetto nel 2015. Jacopo Berincampi ha frequentato con merito il dottorato di ricerca del Dipartimento di Storia, Disegno e Restauro, attivato sempre presso il medesimo Ateneo. Corsista di ricerca presso l'Università di Parma nel 2018, è stato consulente per la diocesi di Viterbo, visiting professor per il College of Architecture dell'University of Texas a San Antonio, borsista per il Centro Cattolico Universitario di Roma e segnista di ricerca presso il Dipartimento di Storia, Disegno e Restauro dell'Architettura della Sapienza. Autore di alcune monografie specialistiche, come Trasformazione del Porto di Fano nel XVIII secolo, Senigliaglia durante la restaurazione, ha diretto il progetto scientifico interdisciplinare di ricerca Giuseppe Boschi, pittore ed architetto fantino. Ha pubblicato numerosi saggi riguardanti i sviluppi dell'architettura altomarciniana e romagnola fra 700 e 800 abilitato dal 2020 alle funzioni di professore in seconda fascia per il settore scientifico disciplinare ICAR 18 e attualmente è docente contratto di storia dell'architettura presso il corso di laurea magistrale in storia dell'arte attivato dalla facoltà di lettere e filosofia dell'Università di Roma Sapienza. A voi la parola. Grazie, grazie. Buon pomeriggio, eh, desidero cominciare questo breve intervento anzitutto ringraziando gli organizzatori Alessandro e Valentina per il gradito invito, sono molto contento di essere qui e mi scuso per non aver potuto prendere parte ai lavori di questa mattina ma la mia attuale situazione lavorativa non mi consentiva di eh, assentarmi. E, ringrazio anche il professor Augusto Academici per alcune importanti indicazioni. Eh, leggerò per rispettare i tempi fissati sempre che trovi tutti. Secondo quanto riportato nella rinomata raccolta di iscrizioni della città di Forlì di Giovanni Casali del 1849, cito, per indefesso amore alle arti belle dobbiamo avere in onore il cavalier Fra Giuseppe Merenda, nato dai conti Fabrizio e Maddalena dei conti Salecchi di Faenza attese egli ai primi studi in patria, tra i quali anche a quelli della pittura sotto la direzione del celebre conte Carlo Cignano. Passò di poi a Bologna ad erudirsi nelle matematiche e nell'architettura civile e militare e di 23 anni, venendo associato alla milizia gerosolimitana col grado di cavaliere, nella suddetta città professò i suoi lenti voti. Dopo aver ricevuto con non comune applauso la laurea in quelle facoltà, si portò a Roma ed Ivi si strinse col rinomatissimo barone Filippo de Stoche, che gli fu largo delle sue condizioni nell'antiquaria massimamente. Alle 4 di maggio del 1723 partì alla volta di Malta, insieme al suo concittadino Fra Valeriano Moratti con la chiamati dal loro gran maestro perché con gli altri cavalieri e architetti ponesse opera al ristauro e alle nuove fortificazioni di quella isola, minacciata dal sultano a Pet Terzo. Cessati quei timori e libero dalle occupazioni impostegli dalla sua religione, amò di rivedere gli amici primieramente a Roma, poscia in patria e congiunti. A lui fu commesso il disegno di diverse fabbriche, che tuttora sorgono maestose in questa città, dopo tante fatiche per la patria, per la famiglia e per la religione, cessò di vivere in un suo luogo di piacere l'anno 1767. Come si vince da questo lungo e approfondito encomio, il nobile dilettante di architettura Giuseppe Merenda, che potete vedere qui il ritratto, non solo si distinse nella Romagna del XVIII secolo per i numerosi cantieri pubblici a cui lo stesso attese in qualità di progettista e, cito, deputato del numero, altresì questi raggiunse grande notorietà in virtù della sua erudizione, che, fondata su un'eccezionale istruzione intrapresa in loco e perfezionata si altrove, e corroborata da una solida rete di contatti internazionali che nel tempo questi costruì, 
proiettare un po' lì in un contesto culturale sovraregionale, snodandosi fra Roma e Malta. Infatti il Patrizio fu spesso in viaggio sia per coltivare i suoi interessi collezionistici, il suo fratello Cesare, come noto fu il principale committente del pittore Pompeo Batoni, sia per servire l'ordine gerosolimitano di cui faceva parte un intenso rapporto di collaborazione che, sviluppato negli anni e puntellato parimenti da risvolti progettuali di qualità, sembra meritevole di ulteriori approfondimenti. Erede di un'antica stirpe, Giuseppe era il primo genito di Fabrizio Merenda, il quale era stato insignito nel 1720 del titolo di Cito Conte con tutti i suoi discendenti in infinito da Augusto II, re di Bologna. Sua madre era invece Maddalena de Salecchi, ultima del suo nome e faentina di altrettanto aristocratico lignaggio. Si trattava perciò di una famiglia di rango e in quel momento politicamente in ascesa sulla scena provinciale. Conseguentemente ci si sarebbe aspettati che al Rampollo sarebbe toccato continuare la dinastia e curarne gli interessi. Invece sembra intendersi dalle fonti che i genitori avessero progetti diversi per il ragazzo, già che lo inviarono nell'urbe come seminarista ancora pressoché fanciullo. Una lettera datata al 1702 e indirizzata al conte dal prefetto per la congregazione delle acque cardinal Francesco Barberini Juniore, già legato di Romagna tra il 1694 e il 1696, conferma questa presenza juvenile nella capitale papalina, sebbene proprio allora Merenda facesse il ritorno nella sua casa natale per motivi di salute non meglio precisati. È perciò a quest'epoca che pare potersi ipotizzare il suo apprendistato nella bottega del poi principe dell'Accademia Clementina Carlo Cignani, al cui seguito è noto che si addestrò nel disegno, verosimilmente mentre questo attendeva l'affresco dell'Assunzione nella Cappella della Madonna del Popolo nella Cattedrale di Forlì. Lo documenta il poeta Pier Maria Ghini, un intellettuale che non mancò diversi decenni dopo di celebrare la formazione del suo mecenate e protettore Merenda, ricordando come non fosse, cito, egli men buon discernitore nell'arte nobilissima della pittura, i primi elementi della quale appresi nella scuola del rinomatissimo signor Carlo Cignani. In quegli anni il blasonato assolse però anche a vari incarichi corrispondenti al suo status sociale. Una gavetta connotata soprattutto da ambascerie che si dovette concludere attorno al 1710, allorché le evidenze archivistiche sopravvissute segnalano come lo stesso avesse avanzato domanda di ammissione presso la sede del Gran Priorato di Venezia, i cui affiliati, da tempo radicati nella provincia di Romagna, condividevano con i merenda amichevoli rapporti di reciproca cortesia. Lo suggerisce il fatto che era loro membro un altro parente di nome Ludovico e lo corrobora in via indiretta il fatto che il nipote di Giuseppe, Livio, divenne rettore della prestigiosa commenda di San Giovanni Battista di Imola nel 1763. Eppure, a dispetto di tali incoraggianti premesse, l'ingresso tra i cavalieri seguì un iter abbastanza tortuoso. Essendo gli ospitalieri un'enclave ristretta di individui di elevata e convalidata estrazione signorile. Più nello specifico, oltre a una serie di attestati comprovanti gli occorrenti quattro quarti di nobiltà del giovane, si rese necessario interpellare alcuni conoscenti ben inseriti all'interno delle gerarchie ecclesiastiche, onde sollecitare la loro intercessione. L'incartamento presentato e le autorità contattate, per cui vale la pena ricordare l'allora cardinal legato di Romagna Tommaso Ruffo di Bagnara, si rivelarono sufficienti, poiché di lì a poco la nomina venne formalizzata. Tuttavia Merenda non professò nell'immediato i voti assunti, un'opzione possibile e nel caso particolare obbligata per poter succedere al padre nei ruoli dirigenziali di Forlì. Salva guardate in tal modo l'onore della famiglia.
familiare, il voto di proprietà lo avrebbe infatti escluso da ogni magistratura e dal seggio patrizio spettante, il neo cavaliere poté così aderire senza riserve a quelli che erano i dettami del sovrano ordine di Malta e partire alla volta della valletta. Il soggiorno maltese non fu di piacere. Richiesta la sua presenza tanto per rafforzare le difese dell'isola, nativa dei complessi rapporti di vicinato con i turchi, quanto per pattugliare il Mediterraneo a tutela dei viaggiatori, Merenda si ritrovò coinvolto in molteplici missioni che lo portarono a muoversi dalle sponde spagnole all'imbocco del mare Adriatico. L'occasione si rivelò ad ogni modo fruttuosa sotto altri profili, poiché, ad esempio, il Patrizio approfittò del fermo invernale per collaborare attivamente alla manutenzione e all'implementazione delle fortificazioni costiere, preparando un vero e proprio rilievo cartografico il cui esito fu, cito, una cassetta del disegno di Malta lunga da sette palmi in circa e larga quasi uno. Tali mie fatiche, raccontava per lettera ai genitori, costituirono l'unico mio divertimento che ho avuto nel tempo di mia permanenza del passato inverno in Malta. Purtroppo di questa attività non sono rimaste tracce tangibili. Ciò non di meno un passaporto da Malta per Roma, datato al 1712, segnala che non più tardi di quell'anno la trasferta ebbe termine e Merenda fece ritorno, presumibilmente a causa dell'improvvisa scomparsa della madre. Questa permanenza non si protrasse però a lungo, poiché poco dopo entrò al servizio del cardinale Wolfgang Hannibal Strattenbach, non so se ho pronunciato bene, chiedo scusa, in qualità del suo coppiere personale e si trasferì con questi a Roma, dove permanse finché non fu richiamato, cito ancora, per servizio della sua religione, un arruolamento forzato di cui il nobile non sembrò tuttavia aver timore. Anzi, dalle lettere conservate si emerge che la chiamata alle armi apparve ai suoi occhi una chance per mettere alla prova de facto le abilità progettuali che andava via via acquisendo, già che, come riferiva il padre, il forlivese si riprometteva durante il viaggio di, cito, vigiliare il studio della fortificazione per adoperarsi con quella in Malta, motivo per cui, caso che colà andassi, come per infallibile lo credo, onde poi non privarla del dissegno già fatto di Malta, ed altresì bisognandone, non avendone alcuna coppia questo presso di me, la prego di mandarmelo per la prima occasione a ciò abbia tempo di farsene una coppia e di mandarmelo. Fortunatamente la crisi internazionale che si andava profilando all'arco delle acque maltesi non sfociò nel temuto conflitto armato e l'aristocratico poté quindi rientrare in sicurezza in Romagna, previa a una sosta nell'Urbe. Non è chiaro se allora o durante uno dei soggiorni precedenti Merenda abbia realizzato alcuni dei disegni di architetture romane recentemente rinvenuti in Canada e che vedete, avete visto alle mie spalle, qui potete vedere un'evoluzione del casino Barberini, ad esempio. Certo è però che nel suo album di disegni, appunti, ben poca attenzione venne riservata alle installazioni militari in favore viceversa dello studio di palazzi e villini di campagna, una scelta comprensibile data la sua appartenenza al centro nobiliare. Infatti tal provenienza lo vincolava materialmente, non poteva accettare forme di pagamento e professionalmente non era permesso esercitare il mestiere se non per divertimento, sebbene rivendicazioni della dignità intellettuale dell'operare artistico affiorassero nel Settecento da più parti della consapevolezza, ormai diffusa, che l'attività manuale o meccanica fosse legata sì al possesso di una tecnica specifica, ma anche veicolata dall'acquisizione di principi teoretici derivanti da studi approfonditi. Sicché il dilettante ambiva probabilmente a misurarsi nella costruzione di edifici di spessore, ovvero luoghi di prestigio e di alta utilità sociale, piuttosto che strettamente pratici. Lo indicano i lavori a cui attese una volta tornato stabilmente in patria. 
Lungi dal tema della guerra e della perizia ingegneristica, il romagnolo si cimentò in una serie di elaborazioni formali di rappresentanza che, commissionategli dal pubblico cittadino, lo videro applicarsi principalmente nella progettazione del nostro proprio locale, in opera dal 1719, e della pescheria risalente a non più tardi del 1723. E specialmente nella formulazione dell'ospedale dei Santissimi Giacomo e Filippo, l'esperienza maltese gli tornò vantaggiosa. D'altronde rinomata era la tradizione assistenziale dei cavalieri e il centro di cura della valletta era conosciuto in tutta Europa come una delle eccellenze del settore. Tale positiva ricaduta la si può avvertire a Forlì sia nel programma distributivo che Merenda mise a punto, sia in alcuni accorgimenti dallo stesso adottati, che se confrontati con le altre, altre attrezzature sanitarie della regione rinnovate nel corso del Settecento, risultano di grande innovatività. Nella fattispecie colpisce non solo l'attenzione al dettaglio rilevabile nella previsione di iscrizioni informative da apporre sulle porte delle corsie e nell'introduzione di armadi di separazione tra i letti destinati ai malati, ma altresì la ricerca di un connubio efficace ed efficiente tra funzione e rappresentazione. Ad ampi spazi comuni facevano riscontro precise ripartizioni che, oltre a scandire visivamente lo spazio, lo organizzavano puntualmente. Questa modulazione si riverberava nei locali accessori circostanti che, posti per lo più a un livello inferiore, fungevano da vespaio tra il terreno nudo e il reparto sovrastante, evitando la risalita dell'umidità e rendendo assai più confortevoli le aree di degenza. Ve lo assicuro perché ho una biblioteca e ci ho passato molto tempo e l'inverno fa una bella differenza stare al piano sotto o al piano sotto. Meditata fu poi pure la collocazione dell'altare, il cui ambito pertinenziale venne risolto in uno snodo spaziale fluido che consentiva agli ammalati di assistere alla funzione religiosa dalla loro postazione, permettendo a medesimo tempo a un eventuale custode di controllare tutti i rami dell'istituto. Conseguentemente la decorazione si riduceva all'essenziale, nessuno dei partiti decorativi interrompe le linee principali della struttura, privilegiando un'articolazione per masse che accostava i corpi di fabbrica saldandoli al perno del crocevia, sotto la cui volta, raccolta in un vasto di purio, prendeva posto la presenza sacra. D'altro canto, come di lì a poco sarebbe accaduto nel caso eccezionale del complesso romano di San Gallicano, anche qui, se per un verso la scienza assumeva ora una posizione preeminente nella formulazione della cosiddetta casa di Dio, la sua stessa denominazione rammentava ancora come, nello stato della Chiesa, continuasse a interare l'episteme prescientifica, secondo cui la salute fosse anzitutto un dono divino. Dunque, almeno sino a questo momento, più che contribuire alla crescita e allo sviluppo dell'ordine di Malta, Merenda si avvalse di quanto ebbe modo di osservare per migliorare la sanità locale. Uno sforzo applaudito dai propri polivesi che i trentini ricordarono alcuni anni dopo nell'edificazione di una struttura non molto dissimile nelle intenzioni ma più radicata nella tradizione rispetto all'exemplum virtutis di partenza. Ciò nonostante, i lavori si interrompero presto, da una parte a causa della cronica carenza di disponibilità economica, Dall'altra per l'assenza del direttore dei lavori, il quale salvò, come si diceva a Pocanzi, nel 1723 alla volta di Malta, non appena si seppe che questa era stata presa di mira da parte del sultano Hamed III. Pure stavolta la spedizione non durò però che qualche mese, come dimostra il fatto che lo stesso venne poco dopo coinvolto dai suoi cittadini nella erigenda fabbrica del suffragio di Forlì. La chiesa di Santa Maria della Visitazione, progettata esplicitamente sul modello del Sant'Andrea al Quirinale di Gian Lorenzo Bernini, 
Era stata ideata dal monaco camaldolese dell'abbazia Ravennate di classe Giuseppe Antonio Soratini. L'erudito disegno dell'architetto non aveva tuttavia incontrato il favore unanime dell'oligarchia polivese, la quale, non convinta della bontà della proposta, lo aveva di qui accusato di aver elaborato troppo frettolosamente il prototipo, delineando di conseguenza un edificio in più punti difettoso. Merenda venne quindi contattato in qualità di consulente di fiducia dell'amministrazione, viste le buone proprie offerte fino a quel momento e la sua appartenenza all'assemblea cittadina. Una valutazione super partes, ma manco troppo direi, che trovò il forlivese d'accordo con il religioso. Del resto è probabile che il dilettante avesse apprezzato molto l'esempio capitolino, oggetto di analisi anche per sua parte, come testimoniano alcuni studi e rielaborazioni presenti nel suo album personale, dai quali si evince, tra l'altro, la straordinaria abilità grafica posseduta dal Patrizio, il quale dimostra di riuscire ad assimilare gli elementi stilistici fondamentali con sicurezza, insistendo sugli aspetti plastici e monumentali dell'immagine, quali opportunità per una variazione ragionata e facilmente riconfigurabile. Inoltre, un esame accurato sembra potersi constatare parimenti una certa affinità elettiva che, senza mai scadere in una sterile comunanza di intenti, indagò indipendentemente per vie parallele le possibilità di razionalizzazione e declinazione locale dell'opera berlignana, con l'obiettivo di individuare nella maniera più adatta per adeguare la realtà a cespiti di entrate come erano appunto della Romagna del XVIII secolo. Un'operazione di scomposizione e ricomposizione secondo criteri di serrata linearità, capaci di dare luogo a innovative sequenze progettuali più regolari e geometricamente semplificate. Una genificazione in continuità con gli insegnamenti di Carlo Fontana presso l'Accademia di San Luca e indispensabile operazione di interiorizzazione per una trasposizione dell'architettura barocca in contesti differenti da quelli di partenza. Questo atteggiamento, teso a una pronta e facile lettura delle membrature, non fu un caso isolato. Anzi, la sua immediatezza venne probabilmente ritenuta da Merenda il principale punto di forza di questo tipo di progettazione, in grado di coniugare i dettami della fede con le esigenze di chiarezza espressiva proprie dei canoni controriformistici, imprescindibili nelle municipalità più periferiche. Lo certificano le altre fabbriche polivesi, alla cui realizzazione lo stesso prese parte, dalla chiesa di Santa Teresa, all'odierna Sant'Antonio Abate in Ravaldino del 1732 circa, al vicino insediamento del Carmine del 1735, senza dimenticare il progetto che presentò assieme a Soratini per l'irrealizzato convento camandolese di Forlì e l'oratorio oggi non più esistente dedicato a San Giovanni Battista e al verato Gerardo rispettivamente il primo santo gerosolimitano e il fondatore dell'ordine di Malta. In particolare, quest'ultimo, sembra che fu l'unico cantiere a cui Merenda lavorò su diretto mandato degli ospitalieri, una commessa relazionabile con il suo impegno nella manutenzione dei possedimenti in situ dei cavalieri e sicuramente connessa al suo titolo di primus commendatarius dell'istituto locale. La pianta, un'aula unica connotata da angoli stondati in cui il presbiterio rimane confinato in un ambito autonomo giusto a posto in profondità, ricalca modalità compositive tipiche per questo genere di attrezzature sacre, sfruttando la conformazione della proprietà a disposizione per collocare nel retro i vari ausiliari. Inoltre, in aderenza alle istanze processionali del cattolicesimo, è privilegiato l'asse longitudinale, come era consuetudine. E precisamente a tale riguardo è interessante sottolineare la stretta analogia che lega questa fabbrica alla contemporanea costruzione della chiesa di Santa Maria della Brenzaglia, nei pressi del ponte Clemente, lungo il fiume Savio, appena fuori Cesena. Il ticinese Pietro Carlo Borboni era stato l'autore di questo piccolo santuario di campagna, coadiuvato da Luigi Bambitelli e Ferdinando Fuga. 
Il cui disegno dialoga intimamente con l'elaborazione del Follibese, definendo una sperimentazione sul tema diffusa sul territorio e condotta da più parti nello stesso frangente. Un dibattito a cui si possono ascrivere parimenti altri casi affine di poco precedenti, quale l'oratorio Bertone alle porte di Faenza, innalzato al capomastro Raffaele Campidori, e il complesso della Beata Vergine della Salute presso Solarolo, invenzione dell'anziano aristocratico. Faentino, Carlo, Cesare, Scaletta. Sicché, sì concludendo, Giuseppe Merenda fu, in ultima analisi, cito, un cavaliere pieno di capacità e a tutti gli effetti, cito ancora, un architetto valentissimo, la cui instancabile riflessione sull'architettura diede un nuovo slancio a Corlì e contribuì ad allineare la regione con le tendenze in circolazione nel resto dello Stato Pontificio. Un aggiornamento in cui l'appartenenza all'ordine di Malta giocò un ruolo indirettamente centrale, offrendo talvolta l'esempio a cui appellarsi, si vede all'ospedale considerato prima, altre volte lo spunto per l'iniziativa progettuale, compiti che, cito, si allogarono sempre all'architetto Merenda, come a colui che otteneva il grado di reputatissimo nell'arte. Ho terminato, grazie per l'attenzione. Bene, ringrazio i relatori di questa sessione. Adesso abbiamo una pausa caffè, poi ritorniamo per altri due interventi alla discussione. E, se possibile essere di nuovo qui entro le quattro e mezza, così possiamo procedere e non tardiamo troppo. Grazie.